it all really starts when the stained glass artist goes into his glass stockroom and selects a sheet of glass. All of the work that has gone on prior to this moment, all the designing, the choice of colors, the enlarging the design into the cartoon, and then the tracing of the cartoon into the individual cut lines, all of this activity really anticipates this moment when the artist selects the actual piece of colored glass that the window will be made of. Designing usually happens in bursts. Oftentimes a design may take me two to three weeks to do, but that's not that I'm sitting down and designing continuously all of that period. I couldn't do that. Designing is very draining. It's a very, um, it's a very intense activity. In the painterly approach, you will start off with a loaded paintbrush and using watercolor simply because it's the most brilliant of all opaque media. Quite often, there'll be a strong textural element in this handmade antique type glass, and this variety of textures in any one given sheet of glass can be used to tremendous advantage by the artist in his design. It's very difficult to represent these colors even with a moderate degree of accuracy in watercolors. Working with watercolors is a very free, it's a very free medium indeed. And uh, somehow in glass, you have to capture that degree of freedom, that f sense of freedom. The other approach is where you start off with a pencil in your hand, and you're drawing line, either for line's sake, or you're drawing line as a boundary of form. And probably the two happen simultaneously. Sometimes if my designs are not working out one way, I'll just go and use the other approach, and then try and achieve a synthesis between the two. glass is used for mounting the individual pieces of glass once the glass has been cut. We prepare a cut line which shows all of the pieces of glass in relationship to each other and in between the pieces of glass is a line drawn which represents the thickness of the, the heart of the lead. Technique in terms of, of accuracy of cutting is crucial. Your whole body position is so important that your eye must be directly over the point at which you're cutting. After the glass is cut, it's waxed up using either beeswax or, in this case, uh, little lumps of plasticine which attach the individual pieces of glass to the easel. When I want to use these textural qualities in the glass, I have to be very careful to ensure that the positioning of the texture corresponds to the flow in the design. individual pieces of glass are waxed up, it's possible for the artist to see for the first time his entire creation as it will look when it's finally completed. And it's at this stage that the decision to change certain colors if they're not working together is made.
In my Solari series, I was influenced by the rough and tentative structures that were sketched by the Italian-American architect Paolo Solari. In going through these sketches, I collected elements from them, which I then put together in a series of um, preliminary sketches of my own, reflecting the curious and fascinating calligraphy of Soleri. Then by a process of abstraction and distillation and redrawing, uh, I was able to reach a point where I could start adding color. As the central element of the design was linear, the, the choice of, of color had to be sufficiently restrained not to, to dominate the element of line. And so I, I chose glass, which would, through its transparency and uh, its opacity, reinforce the, the linear image. But because also the design was essentially an organic one, I introduced horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines, which strengthened the design, sort of tightened it up, and gave it uh, much more of a sense of, of solidity. One of the things about choosing the, the different types of glass is the uh, effect of the different times of the day, the different qualities of light on the design and uh, how the design will look under these conditions. It's an art form which has been locked into architecture as a subsidiary or an auxiliary art. And I think this has been, in one sense, the glory of stained glass and in another sense, probably its worst enemy. Once the artist is satisfied with the glass on the easel, he will then take it and put it into lead. One of the characteristics of the society we live in today is that it is highly mobile. And so if you're um, designing for a domestic situation, one of the requirements is to make your art portable. Today, uh, a, a number of artists are working on autonomous pieces, but I think the real challenge for stained glass is as it always was in an architectural setting. And uh, it's important for us today to somehow reestablish the link which has been broken over the years between the decorative arts and architecture. This uh, panel that I'm working on now, for example, is intended to humanize a typical high-rise office space, which would uh, add a, a touch of color and, uh, and excitement uh, into an otherwise fairly drab interior. Once uh, we start putting the glass into lead, the glazing process, the rest of the steps in the making of the window are purely technical steps. The artistic choices at this stage have all been made. And from here on, uh, it's purely a question of craftsmanship. Starting with the lead ingots from a, from a lead smelter, the castings are a special shape which are designed to, to go into this electrically driven mill. On the mill end, I can, by changing the milling wheels or the dies themselves, I can vary the sizes of the lead that I produce uh, quite considerably. When the lead comes out of the mill, it's, it's quite hot, and uh, even after it's been stretched to straighten it, it's still quite warm, and it's really quite a pleasure to use. It's easier to cut uh, and to shape uh, lead that is in this condition than if it's been stored for a long time. The actual glazing, you develop a rhythm of um, glass, lead, cutting the lead, fitting the lead, more glass, cutting again. And as you speed up in an uninterrupted process, the movement of your hands and tools develops a pattern which is very, very satisfying and, and very, very sort of um, allows your mind to, to wander and to 
consider the next design that you're about to embark on. Once all the, the lead has been cut and fitted, each joint where lead meets lead has to be soldered. The flux permits the solder and the lead to melt at a temperature lower than would otherwise be the case. Once all the soldering has been completed, the panel is still far from strong enough or rigid enough to be used in a window and of course isn't waterproof, so we have to cement the panel. The cement that I use is very much of a, of a witch's brew of um, plaster of Paris and linseed oil and, and black coloring and red oxide of lead and so on. This is mixed into a, a consistency of a thick treacle. The cement being brushed in in such a way that the uh, cement completely penetrates the space around each piece of glass and each piece of lead. When the cement has had a chance to harden for, say, about 24 hours, all the, the residue of the cement is carefully cleaned away using special little wooden tools which prevent scratching of the glass. Once the panel has been cleaned, the process of making the stained glass window is now considered to be complete. I would subscribe to the definition of stained glass that says it is the art of painting with light. The dynamic element in stained glass is light, daylight in all its different forms, its different modalities, its different times of day, sun, cloud and so on, shadow. And all of these aspects of light have to be understood and be borne in mind by the stained glass artist, who, if he's doing anything at all, is manipulating this powerful natural energy.